Hi, I'm Pat Gunn, and I thought I should record my thoughts during these uh, presently very difficult times. Um, so most recently, New York City uh, announced a, a curfew. Uh, the city will be closed to non-essential workers. Uh, we're not supposed to head outside. I think starting in a little over an hour from now. And earlier today, uh, President Trump, um, he announced that uh, he had a, a phone call with uh, with several governors, and he told them that they should use force to dominate. Uh, the, the, uh, the protests that are happening in their states. And he has uh, been talking about using the military to quell protests, possibly over the objections of governors and mayors. I find this to be unacceptable. Not that much that Trump has done has shown much of a regard for our traditions or our laws. I think he's been a uniquely bad president. And when I say that, I'm not talking about my particular values and the left right normal political sway that we have here. I consider that healthy. I, I don't think anybody really likes seeing their, their values on that kind of teeter totter or their policy priorities bouncing up and down that way. Um, but we expect it and to a certain degree it's healthy because the ideas that we have for, uh, for policy, we won't get them right the first time, wh whatever side of the spectrum uh, we're on. And so one, uh, the thought presently in this time of high tension is that particularly good policies that people broadly seem to like will be accepted by the the general public, even though the the party typically that didn't uh, that wasn't the driver for uh, for those politics, they're not going to be happy about it, and they might try to sabotage it, or at least they will potentially make some moves to limit it. And that, uh, but if a, if a policy can survive for long enough and it's still popular, then that, that losing party will eventually probably accept some form of it. And the back and forth that happens um, over it might make it better. Uh, the, the least popular bits of it might be pulled back uh, the most popular bits might survive through all the revisions as the parties have their little tug of war uh, on it. That's potentially healthy. Um, and in better times, you would actually have a certain amount of uh, cooperation between the parties on legislature that can help us deal with uh, the issues at hand. Right now, the parties are quite polarized, and there are a variety of reasons for that, and they're, they're probably too complicated to go into right now, and I, I don't think that really there's a simple, uh, simple group to point fingers at or a side to point fingers at, um, but things have broken down to a, a semi-hostile uh, norm for now. I think the danger is that things will get worse. And in particular, I, I don't see Trump's actions as being remotely helpful to lessen uh, that tendency. We have him using his family, in particular his sons, as ways to ramp up conflict as ways to push a narrative where um, 
where people are invited to do things to annoy or infuriate the other side of the political spectrum. And unfortunately, when you do this, you provoke the same kind of thing from the other side. And we're seeing that. As president, I would expect and hope that he would rise above that. But knowing him, he's almost uniquely unlikely to. Uh, this kind of maximally hostile politics is the way that uh, that populism tends to work, whether it's on the right or the left. And Trump is a populist. And he's doing what populists do. And that's that's bad for our democracy and it, it it risks if if you end up having both sides do that and continued ramping up of hostilities that comes from that kind of uh trigger a liberal trigger a conservative let's do things primarily to annoy trump let's do things to uh, uh let's encourage this kind of uh personal uh, enjoyment of uh, the pain of the other side of the political spectrum, uh, spectrum. if that ramps up continually, then eventually you have the, the Latin American situation where politics swing very widely between both sides and they don't talk to each other. They ignore all the legal inter international norms. It becomes about winning at all costs. And the way that democracy normally works is that you have this notion of rules and tests and limits. And uh, if you have norms where you just abide by those and you know that you're not going to be in power forever and you don't see the other side as inhuman or somebody who you'd really, really enjoy uh, making them angry or unhappy or in particular violence towards them, if if you can avoid those things, then you can have a workable, f fairly, uh, you, you can have the friendly rival situation, which is generally, it's a pretty healthy way for democracies to work. You also don't want party whips to be particularly powerful, and you don't want the general population to punish people they elect for working with the other side. And... And that's uh, those are those are the conditions that that you want for a working democracy. And what I see recently is Trump continuing to move us further from what we need to function uh, as a democracy. This encouragement to uh, to use the military uh, to to crush dissent, um, encouraging governors to dominate. Uh, and I, I understand the frustrations right now that led to the protests. There are a lot of reforms that we should do relating to police power. Uh, there are some very concrete things that, that we can do uh, there that would make our, uh, our, uh, the relationship between police and our citizens healthier. And the instigating incidents were tragic, and they shouldn't keep happening. Uh, kneeling on somebody's neck in, until they die, it doesn't matter if they have preconditions. That kind of uh, tactic by the police should not be part of the repertoire. And, uh, and there's this fe uh, feeling of lack of safety that certain populations have when when they don't feel that society is about them, that it will protect them equally, uh, that it cares about their well-being, or that it will investigate uh, abuses against them. That, it, that kind of thing is corrosive to democracy too. And unfortunately, it creates the situations uh, where they themselves will escalate and behave inappropriately, loot stores, use violence against uh, police and against others. And there are also these minor political actors in our system 
that have always been eager to tear uh, tear everything down. And these groups exist on the right and the left, uh, and they're dangerous, and they're they're probably delighted because they never believed in society to begin with. You get young punk kids that uh, that believe that the status quo is so terrible and it's so easy to build something better that uh, that ripping everything down and uh, destroying storefronts and uh, attacking the police and not believing that they can ever be positive. That's their standard way of being. And then you have groups on the right that are calling for maximizing violence against them. And it just piles on until s society at least temporarily ceases to, to function correctly. And I think that's what we're seeing right now with the curfews. It's really, it's a sign of failings from many places that lead to uh, cities to do this kind of thing. Maybe, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's the right thing to do right now. But how we got here was not right. Uh, and it would be nice to have our political leaders doing a better job to deal with things. Now, I give Cuomo a certain amount of credit. He he reviewed the the um, the video footage of of the instigators of of this whole mess. Uh, he reviewed the video footage uh, of of uh, police cars that were driving into crowds, and he said. This is inexplicable. Uh, I I have a really tough time imagining how this could be an, uh, how this could be acceptable, but I'm not going to judge it myself based on these actions. I'm going to appoint an independent investigator, which is very much the right thing to do, uh, because you want somebody distant from the local political forces and the chumminess that might taint the results of an investigation. And so, at least here, Cuomo seems to be doing the, uh, the right thing. Now, I'm not commenting on other things he might have done because I only have so much time to watch the news and I might have missed something. And maybe by the time people are seeing this, maybe Cuomo will have done some new really bad things. I don't know. But I appreciate that Cuomo is uh, looking at the structural issues uh, I appreciate that he's offering concrete advice on how can we change the laws to limit these abuses. Uh, now, historically, I've been f pretty frustrated with Cuomo for his handling of the MTA. Uh, and there are some other uh, other areas where, Crum uh, where Cuomo has done things where I, I don't think it's been the right thing. And... Not as bad as Bill de Blasio, who I think on, almost never does the right thing. Um, but, but I have a, a certain amount of frustration with Cuomo. But here I appreciate the message. I appreciate the concern and, and the actions that he's t uh, taken. But I, I think it's important that we find ways to get some of this systemic change in... Um, because otherwise these uh, misuses of force will keep happening and people will protest and a certain fringe there will uh, will turn uh, they'll see the protest and they'll raise it to a uh, to a riot at least immediately around them and the riots I condemn them as strongly as I condemn the acts that led to them but we need to fix these uh, issues as a, uh, as a society. Um, I've been reading up on what are the policies that we need to get there. Uh, and there are some groups that study uh, police misuse of force that have some, ha they have concrete policy advice. And let me pull up right now one of them that that I, I saw that line up with things uh, that that I already want with one exception 
and uh, and that I would like to to lend what little voice that I have. I would like to lend my voice to. Okay, so I brought it uh, brought it up. This uh, this is from a website called joincampaignzero.org. Uh, and it's their, their research uh, subsection. And the reason that I like this is that I, I believe that policy is typically how you fix problems in a country. And I, I don't think you fix it with heroes. I don't really think that you fix it with protests, although protests can be useful to, uh, to create momentum. Uh, but you, what, the way that you do it is with good policy executed correctly over time. That that's what solves societal problems. And so let's let's go over their suggestions because they have ten suggestions, and I want to talk a little bit about each of them. Now, the first I actually disagree with, and it's the only one that I significantly disagree with, um, and that is end broken windows policing. And they they go into some reasons for doing it and they they break down some bad arguments for broken windows policing if you're not familiar with it broken windows is the idea that you focus around or you you make sure that you uh you have adequate policing to squash property crime graffiti uh and other low grade misbehavior uh and some people will argue that broken windows policing it helps squash uh habits of crime and uh and this this join campaign zero website argues that that is not true to me it's unimportant whether it's true or not that's not why i support broken windows policing for me it's it's a quality of life issue and i think it's uh it's worth doing purely because it makes life better for people in the city. Uh, it means that you're not dealing with literal broken windows. It's You're not dealing with a lot of petty crime, littering, um, stuff like that. Uh, and it's important that, that our cities be pleasant places to live. And broken windows policing just, it makes life more pleasant. Uh, and we don't have to deal with the uh, irritation of watching people break uh, break uh, well-known laws that that are good laws uh, so I, I disagree with them on that but I, I still wanted to, to bring it up uh, I still want to mention this website because in my view all the other suggestions are solid the second thing that they mention is community oversight where they have civilian oversight structures that uh, that can uh, that can monitor and respond to uh, police use of force and, and in general policing. To me, that that's a that's an important thing. You want to have lines of co uh, conversation that are open between uh, police and the communities that they serve. Um, this also helps. Uh, it helps the police because uh, it increases uh, societal trust of police by making it easier to empathize with police because you talk with them. It can help police avoid mistakes. It can lead to useful hints that uh, minimize false targeting. It can require people to explain themselves when they screw up and talk about how they're going to prevent that screw up from happening again. There's a lot of good that comes from community oversight of police. The third thing that they mention is limiting use of force. And this too is something that I see as very, very healthy. Um, the uh, U.S. Uh, police forces typically don't have sufficiently restrictive um, uh, limits on when they can use force. Uh, and this, this means that a lot of, a, a lot of police interactions, uh, even enforcement actions, they involve weapons that shouldn't be used. They in, uh, involve procedures that, uh, that shouldn't be used. Uh, they're, uh, they're a lot deadlier than they need to be, and that is what 
Um, <coughs> excuse me. That's the issue that led to these protests and everything that happened since. Um, so these standards and these uh, these tools, uh, these norms for police conduct are are uh, are contributing to an ongoing problem. And I think we need to find ways for most policing to happen without guns. Ideally, for most police not to have guns. Um, ideally, for most enforcement actions not to involve guns or other d uh, dangerous uh, weapons. And that includes things like rubber bullets, which, yes, they're not deadly, but you can blind people with them. Uh, you don't want uh, to cripple people uh, unnecessarily uh and uh so so that's that's the third thing the fourth thing is to have ind independent investigations and prosecutions over uh, police misbehavior and what this is pointing out is that often uh you end up having internal uh, affairs that's too close socially and politically to the police forces that they're looking over. And this is one of the things that Cuomo mentioned as being a problem. And so you ideally want to have a lot of independence uh, on part of the investigations and prosecutions of police mis misconduct. And the goal here isn't that every accusation leads to a police person losing their job or uh, or facing discipline. That's not the goal. The, the goal is simply that you don't have uh, those investigations done by the police force or their close friends. Pull them in from some other part of the state uh, or just something to achieve very significant distance between investigation and prosecution actions and the, and the rank and file police. And the other thing, just to address a possible concern that people often bring up, the, the goal is not to make police afraid to enforce the law, and it's not to bury them under endless investigations and endless lawsuits, but it is to end a culture of impunity uh, that has developed in, uh, in, some police, uh, in some police departments. And I expect, and I, I hope, that 95% of police actions and police people, it wouldn't, it wouldn't impact them at all. Because I, I, I believe that most police, they want to do the right thing, and they generally do do the right thing. The problem, in my view, is probably that 5% that uses force too enthusiastically, that escalates unnecessarily, uh, and they need to be reined in because it only takes a small percentage of bad eggs to give, to create reasonable doubt uh, on uh, on behalf of the general population, and to uh, and to give police in general a really bad reputation, and that leads that lack of trust on both sides leads to. Uh, to even more escalation, you have to st to start breaking these chains of uh, of bad situation, reinforcing bad situation. Now, the next, the fifth, is community rep uh, representation, and here we're getting into a topic where I'm a little uncomfortable with it, but I I think. I can see there being a sufficiently strong argument for it that I'm willing to step a little bit away from my usual principles. And the idea here is that you want to have hiring for the police that's bent towards being representative of the communities that the police serve. And the reason that I, I ordinarily would be uncomfortable with this is that it can end up creating what amounts to a racial preference in hiring. And in my view, such things have to be incredibly strongly justified because on their face, they're discriminatory. And I, I don't like the idea of, of hiring or presence on any type of uh, 
societal structure depending on the color of your skin or your gender or other things that just generally don't uh, don't matter but in this case I think having a mild to moderate preference here is essential for community trust and it's so essential towards the proper functioning of police that I am willing to bend uh, uh, I'm willing to consider this to be an exception to my ordinary, ordinarily very strong intuition that this kind of thing is intrinsically unjust. And maybe eventually we can make a better world where, with all the rest of the things, we don't need to keep doing this. But I think for at least a, a significant time, until trust is restored... In, in the cities where it's not present, we should consider having a, a, a mild to moderate bend towards representativeness for membership on the, on the police force. The sixth is body cams, filming the police. Now I've been supportive of this for a very long time. I think it can help the police it can certainly help those who are falsely accused of misbehavior. It can lead, uh, when people know that things are recorded, it can lead them to not make false claims. It can also give them a certain amount of trust that uh, their interaction with the police will not uh, be something that, that disappears into he said, uh, she said style uh, mutual lying because when it's recorded and ideally maybe not just with body cams but with with other types of recording it means that that people can check and so i i support uh body cams they also mentioned filming the police and establishing a, a firm nationwide right to record police interactions i think that's also a really good idea uh and yes some people say that uh, that this means that police might be afraid to do their job. And I would say in response that the 95% of police that I believe are doing their job correctly, in the end, even if they have to do an unpleasant enforcement that's unpopular at the moment, history will judge them well. And you'll you'll build enough trust with the community that they'll accept that look, we had it on film. These are our rules. Your the rules will generally serve the public interest. I believe I trust the general population enough to go along with that uh, in the long run. And in the meantime, body cams and filming of police they help build that trust, and they they protect good cops. They help weed out bad cops. They also help weed out false accusations towards the police. So uh, I've long supported that, and I'm happy to see that Join Campaign Zero also supports uh, that. Now the seventh uh, is something where I uh, I feel that I still need to understand more of the specifics, uh, and that's training. And they show that training on de-escalation is helpful. Uh, they show that, that training on use of force is helpful. And uh, I, I believe that, that improving training on these matters can be helpful. Uh, I, I want to see police have more tools in their toolbox than use of, uh, use of force, particularly deadly force. Now they have a few specifics in here that, uh, that I'm not, uh, not sure that I agree with. They talk about um, implicit bias. And as far as I understand, implicit bias is not a well-supported theory. We've seen it not produce anything useful in workplaces that have done implicit bias training. We've seen a lot of the early advocates of that kind of training uh, go back on their initial support for it. But that's not the only thing that they talk about. And I think uh, in general, uh, we should want police to have training for nonviolent enforcement. And, and let's talk about uh, why briefly. 
I understand that some people, the way that they approach policing, uh, the way that they think about policing, rather, is that they think either somebody's a good guy or a bad guy. And if they're a bad guy, they deserve what's coming to them. And they're, if they're a good guy, then nothing bad should happen to them from interactions with the police. And I understand the intuitions there. And I am not arguing for nothing happening or letting people go in the name of de-escalation. What I am against is excessive violence against people. Because in the end, our goal should not be the death of bad people. Um, our goal should be the rehabilitation uh, of people who, who have done bad things. Our goal should be their survival. Our goal should be not ripping apart the societal fabric entirely when somebody has stepped beyond the acceptable. And when, if somebody is killed as a, as a result of police action, uh, even if they're doing something terrible, like holding up a store, then their family has to deal with uh, that person no longer being there. And I don't think most people are fair enough not to, not to build a lot of resentment towards society and towards the police for that kind of action. And that hurts society, and it hurts the ability of police to do what they need to do. Uh... And if they have kids, uh, a missing parent uh, is a factor in potential criminality of future generations. And we shouldn't be contributing to that. We should try to find ways to always stack the deck for families to be healthy and non-criminal and uh, for them to be vested in society and for them to believe in the laws and to cooperate with the police in the general sense uh, we, we shouldn't be stacking the deck the other way an excessive use of force particularly if it leads to death or uh, unnecessarily violence or excessively long jail time it damages society in that way the eighth thing that they mention is ending for-profit policing. And here they're talking about civil forfeiture laws and other things that uh, other historical artifacts in our legal system that have resulted in people sometimes who haven't even been accused of a crime uh, to have large amounts of property confiscated from them, often with uh, with it being very difficult to ever get that property back. And these are historical aberrations. In my view, they should be fixed. I would also mix into this uh, a concern of my own ending for-profit jails um, because they also uh, they take away a lot of our levers as a, uh, as a society to help people transition as they near the end of their sentence back into a uh, normal civilian life where they are not likely to be heading right back into the prison system. Uh, we don't want there to be a profit motive to keep people in jail or to put people in jail. Uh, and there have been some really nefarious types of corruption relating to uh, lobbying from uh, for-profit uh, jail, uh, from for-profit jails, uh, unsavory connections between judges and the owners of for-profit uh, prisons, things like that. That just should never come up. There should never be a profit motive there, uh, and we shouldn't have to keep on looking for it uh, when it keeps on turning up. Uh, but yeah, we, we should also uh, end uh, civil asset forfeiture or at least put it under much stricter scrutiny. The ninth thing that they mention is demilitarization. And here they're pointing out that there are some unfortunate policies that uh, uh, of use of military surplus equipment where when the military is done with certain tools, 
they find ways to uh, sell or push it to local police departments because they don't need it anymore. And the police departments are often left with weaponry that they really shouldn't be using. And it, often, and it can come with strings attached, such as showing that you're actually using it. These things diminish trust in the police. When you see a policeman with a machine gun, you're going to be much less trust, uh, trusting, much less likely to interact with them than if, uh, if they're carrying a pistol or a bobby club or something like that. Um, this, uh, this use of military hardware uh, by the police should stop. And finally, they're suggesting some police union contract reform. And here they're, they're talking about scrutiny for the contents of police contract and some of the unfortunate things that often get negotiated for by police unions. Now, this is an area where it's hard to, it's hard to fix because there are potentially legitimate issues on both sides. But I think we have to show a strong interest in fixing them. Those contracts need to be put under scrutiny, and we need to make sure that they serve the public interest and ideally serve notions of the public interest that aren't based on defective notions that the right way to keep a population compliant is through force. Um, overwhelming force is not our model for policing in the United States. It should not be. Um, it is much less effective and much more corrosive than this notion of a, a mixed use of force and believe uh, and belief that you're going to get a fair shake from the cops and that uh, the laws and our legal system are fair uh, and and uh, so we don't want the 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 contracts to be based on on this defective notion uh, we don't want this tough on crime thing to go too far there, it is possible to go way, uh, way too far the other way, but we haven't really seen that for a long time, even though people keep on bringing up the possibility of it or they lie about um, what it looks like. So the, these 10 things are things that we need to be talking about as part of structural reform of how policing works in the United States. Now, again, I would prefer maybe ditch the first one. Let's let's keep on doing broken windows. Uh, but but the rest of them, they're things that I think would make society better and we should address them. Uh, it's it's good for policing. It's good for the general population. It's good for keeping such a large percentage of our uh, population uh, out of prison because th those numbers are ridiculous. We we keep way too many people in jail. We have far uh, we have we have more than I think any other highly developed nation. We have a much higher percentage of our population behind bars at any given time, and this this is a marker of our failings as a society. And, and I think a lot of it has to deal with poor trust between police and the general population, misstructuring of our, uh, of our justice system, and in particular, our prison system. And these, uh, these things in Campaign Zero, they're not focused around our prison system. And I think we should be giving just as much attention to that as we are to police use of force but police use of force is the issue immediately in front of us with these riots. Uh, and, uh, and so I, I think that hopefully we can use this moment to build support for fixing some of these things. Uh, I hope. Anyhow, those are my thoughts on, on these matters. Uh, if you have your own thoughts, you can leave it in the comments. Um, if there are other things that you would like to see me talk about, I'm happy to share my, my views if I think that I have anything interesting to say on a topic. Uh, well, I, I'm hoping that things don't get too, uh, too, uh, 
I'm hoping that things don't get too much crazier over the next few days. Uh, I'm really worried about the things that Trump might do. Uh, he does not seem to have even remotely good judgment. And in particular, I, I worry about his desperation and all the, the weird, weird machismo stuff going on in his head. Uh, and his apparent lack of any good advisors around him uh, able to get him to cut this shit out. Anyhow, uh, that's that's what I got on the, these topics. Uh, leave any comments uh, or drop me an email if if you want to have a conversation. Um, it, I, I, I probably won't engage with anything particularly impolite, but if you want to have a thoughtful, long discussion on these these topics, uh, I am probably open to it, uh, or at least to give a certain amount of time to that kind of thing. Take care. Bye-bye.